Beethoven's String Quartet Opus 127 is the first of his so-called late quartets. Opus 95, his previous quartet, was written 14 years earlier, and the difference of expression could hardly be greater. Opus 95 is explosive and compact. It feels like an existential struggle. Opus 127, on the other hand, is infused with a sense of deep joy. It is lyrical and tender with a timeless quality and spiritual overtones. So what happened in those 14 years? Napoleon, first revered by Beethoven as an idealistic reformer and then reviled by him as just another tyrant, is defeated in 1814. Prince Metternich comes to power in Austria. Extremely conservative and an anti-revolutionary, in 1819, he uses the Karlsbad decrees to secure his power in a new era of repression. It seems that the hopes of achieving the ideals of the French Revolution, the ideal of a society based on freedom, equality, and tolerance, are lost. In his personal life, Beethoven becomes increasingly isolated. His deafness, already troubling two decades earlier, becomes so severe that by 1818, communication is only possible through the use of conversation books. Beethoven begins to write in a diary at this time. He makes many references to living only for his art, as well as jotting down excerpts from ancient Greek and Roman works, from Christian writings, quotes from various philosophers, and even from spiritual Hindu writings. From these notes, quotes, and reflections, we get the impression that Beethoven's thoughts were turning increasingly inward and upward. This can be clearly heard in the two great works directly preceding this quartet, the Ninth Symphony and Misa Solemnis. This quartet opens with six bars marked maestoso. We hear three rising E-flat major chords. Maestoso is a marking which Beethoven often uses when the music describes divine power. For instance, in Misa Solemnis, at Quonium tu solus sanctus, for you alone are holy, three E-flat major chords rising. We'll see the prevalence of the number three in this work, the number of the Trinity. And E-flat major, the tonality often used when describing noble high ideals, as in Mozart's The Magic Flute, which also begins with three rising chords. At the top of the melodic ascent, we reach a C, harmonized with A-flat major, the subdominant. After an enraptured embellishment in the first violin, we enter a gently descending allegro theme in three-quarter time, marked teneramente, or tenderly. This allegro theme is built from a combination of two motives. The first is a rising fourth and falling third, and the second is a rising chromatic motive, from B flat to B natural to C. If we turn the first of these motives around, we can recognize the motto from his Quartet Opus 135, Es muss sein. This is an extraordinary beginning, notable for its juxtaposition of power and tenderness. A yearning second theme in G minor leads to a three-note closing motive. The development section begins with a second maestoso, this time in G major, and after some modulating around our allegro theme, 
we descend from forte to pianissimo through the entire range of the string quartet, four octaves down to C minor, with a low C in the cello. From this dangerous place, we are pulled into the most dramatic moment of the movement. The three-note closing motive becomes a battleground. Beethoven takes this three-note motive through the voices in three groups of four bars each, and each time rising a half step. Thus, the overall structure of this passage is our chromatic rising motive. <laughs> we arrive at the third maestoso in glorious C major, like a divine command, as in Haydn's creation at the resplendent C major, let there be light. This climactic arrival should be the recapitulation, but as in the opening material, this arrival on C is the midpoint of a symmetrical structure. Beethoven works his way back towards the home key of E-flat major, and the allegro theme of the recapitulation enters unannounced, almost unnoticed. <laughs> the second movement is a lyrical set of modulating variations in A-flat major. The theme has a striking resemblance to an aria in Fidelio, Com Hoffnung, where Leonora implores hope not to leave her. This glowing aria in the first violin is repeated by the cello while the first violin plays a counter theme above. The variations will be on both the theme and the counter theme making this one of the richest and most complex variation movements in the string quartet literature. The viola and cello lead us downstairs to a little cabaret theater for the second variation. We hear a comedy routine between the two violins, a witty back and forth of elbow nudging syncopations and mustache twirling responses. <laughs> Suddenly, a shocking D-flat minor chord interrupts. Perhaps someone has taken offense. But after a few little apologetic gestures, the anger dissipates and good humor is restored. The repartee ends on an enigmatic C-sharp to E in unison. What is this? Are we being led back to the dark regions of D-flat minor? But then the second violin bows down to G-sharp, transforming the tonality to a radiant E major. E major carries connotations of the celestial, and here it serves to transform the theme into a fervent hymn. The aria now rises three times to a forte climax, each time to a chord built on C in the bass. In the first one, the B pedal remains persistently throughout, intensifying the otherwise normal C7 chord. Notice how, 
as in the first movement, C is again here in a central position in the symmetry of the movement. After these heights, Beethoven brings us gently back down to earth by simply lowering E to E flat. The coda brings a sense of farewell with reminiscences of the fourth variation and echoes of the harmonic structure within just a few bars. Using the three chords of the cadence of the theme, Beethoven moves from D flat major to E major and back to A flat major. The key harmonic shifts of the entire movement reduced to their essence. <laughs> 